It's the biggest adventure of our lives, all in a bid to raise awareness about climate change and the world's melting glaciers. This all used to be glacier, and now it's just a barren valley. Join me, Sean Lee Davis, as my Project Sea Change team and I attempt to climb the famed Mount Kilimanjaro, Africa's tallest mountain. It never seems to end. Wildlife is under threat like never before. Man-made climate change, habitat loss and illegal poaching are devastating the world's environments. We've lost half the animal species on the planet in the last 40 years, and all large marine life could become extinct by 2050. I'm Sean Lee Davis, a photographer, filmmaker and conservationist with a passion for adventure. I photographed some of Asia's most glamorous celebrities, and now I'm turning my camera on nature's true beauty. I'm out to showcase the glory of the natural world and raise critical awareness about poaching and exploitation. Join me on Adventures to the Edge. That is Mount Kilimanjaro, which means Mountain of Greatness. It's Africa's highest standing mountain and the world's tallest freestanding mountain. It's also symbolic of the rapid climate change that's taking place on our planet. And as you'll see, we need to act fast to do something about it. I'm on a journey to create a fine art photo exhibition and book to raise awareness about climate change and endangered wildlife. And that quest begins here. Kilimanjaro towers 5,895 meters above sea level. That's the equivalent of stacking seven of the world's tallest skyscraper, one on top of the other. The mountain is almost unique in that every part of the Earth's ecosystem is represented here. Glaciers have permanently covered the peak for tens of thousands of years, but now, due to accelerating climate change, so much of them have melted. And that's why I wanted to start the series here. My Project Sea Change expedition would raise funds for charity and bring much-needed awareness to the climate change debate. To maximize publicity back in Hong Kong, I decided to take celebrity couple Anthony and Jocelyn Sandstrom, celebrity model Rosemary Vandenbroek, and investor Janice Cha. I always knew it was there, but it was never something that I ever thought I would go and do. I didn't have any expectations. I knew it was going to be a lot of fun, and I knew it was going to be a little bit difficult. I knew as much as I learned in geography that it's um, a place in Tanzania. It was my first time ever in Tanzania and it's such an amazing, amazing place. My great friend Jack Brockway, who is also the nephew of mogul Sir Richard Branson, volunteered to come along and be one of the main cameramen. When Sean first asked me whether I could come along and uh, help record and document it, I thought yeah, what a great cause. You know, a few weeks before the climb, I was thinking, what am I doing? I'm going to go climb Kilimanjaro with a bunch of models who have never really done anything like this before. Our journey begins at the town of Moshi, on the border of Tanzania and Kenya, the jumping off point for most expeditions climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. We're here at Londorossi Gate to start the climb. We now head out and have our first day of climbing. All climbers on Kilimanjaro have to use one of the qualified guide and tour operators. These are properly trained, experienced guides who are familiar with the mountain. Plus, they manage tents, equipment, and sufficient food and medical supplies for the whole journey. Everything has to be carried up on foot. The guides, they were phenomenal. Professionals in what they do, very strong, strong men. They were the soul of the mountain and, and incredibly helpful at all the times that we needed them. From Londorossi Gate, we head up through lush tropical rainforest towards Big Tree Camp at 2,750 meters above sea level, our first camp for the night. Technically, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro is not too difficult at the beginning. The mountain's wide expanse and gentle slopes mean it is essentially a long hike for the first few days. What will be challenging is the altitude. We're going to be climbing up to 5,895 meters above sea level. It's one of the only places on the planet where you can actually climb through or walk through all seven ecosystems. Starting at tropical rainforest, we pass through moorlands, heath, then subalpine desert, and finally reaching sub-zero Arctic conditions at the summit. At the summit altitude, our blood oxygen levels could drop down to below 60%, which can be very serious, if not life-threatening. Day one on Kilimanjaro. It's beautiful, fresh air. I can actually breathe. 
It's a nice little walk in the park so far. There was a lot of adrenaline and everyone's really excited. It was beautiful. You just want to embrace every single moment. <laughs> Today has been surprisingly easy. So far, there's been a lot of fun and bonding within the group. But we all know that bigger challenges await. Bright and early on day two, we set off under beautiful blue skies and perfect hiking conditions. Today, we hike towards Shira One Camp at 3,500 meters above sea level. The sun is shining. The views are spectacular. We pass through a wooded area where vast strands of moss hang from the trees and long, flowing masses, creating what appears to be a fairy forest. And Rosemary is taking a particular interest in the local flora. It's like something out of an Edward Norton film. I think she means Tim Burton. <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> so the fairy forest was quite overwhelming with the size and the vastness of the trees. It was a surreal experience walking through there. So far, the mountain seems no match for us. With our guide singing merrily, it feels like one grand hike as we pass into the moorlands. It's so beautiful and never want to stop. We're up at the crack of dawn to continue our walk through the vast and spectacular moorland region. We head across the Shira Plateau, acclimatizing through a long but gentle climb to Shira 2 camp at 3,850 meters above sea level. It's getting colder and drier, but our energy and spirits remain high. The guide's singing and dancing is becoming infectious. <laughs> Janice forms a particularly strong bond with the guides and has already learned over 50 words in Swahili, the local language. This means it is a duty to protect the world for the next generation. By the end of day three, we camp on the upper edge of the heath at 3,800 meters above sea level with a stunning view of Kilimanjaro's peak in the background. The sun shines bright as we head up through more rocky terrain. For all of us, this is where it starts to get difficult and the breathing gets harder and harder. At 4,000 meters above sea level, a person can suffer from shortness of breath, fatigue, confusion and more. Brain and heart organs can also be compromised. The temperature is getting much colder now. We start going through all these different climates. It really looked like it was another planet. It's a strenuous morning climb to Lava Tower. My foot has locked up here and here. I think it's the tendon. I must have twisted it somehow. I don't even remember doing it. And what I'd done was I'd sprained my ACL and it started getting me worried about the summit climb because I didn't want to be the one who wasn't going to make it to the top. That's when you start realizing like, you know what? This is a mountain that needs to have some respect. But there's no turning back, and we continue on, inspired by the extraordinary windswept, almost alien landscapes. After resting at Lava Tower, we head down to Barranco Camp. Despite my injury, that evening I celebrate my birthday in a cold tent with the team. Happy birthday to you! Happy birthday to Suddenly, the entire group of guides appears in the tent with the cake they've baked over a campfire. It turns into the best birthday celebration I've ever had. After a night of celebrations, we wake up to the bitter cold, a strong reminder of the challenges ahead. It's really showing now what we're really made of, but we're really witnessing a lot of climate change and seeing firsthand brand new riverbeds that weren't here four years ago. And now they're here because of the glaciers melting really quickly. This is our first real sign that climate change has taken a serious toll on the mountain's glaciers. The guides had explained to me the riverbed had just been created recently. I knew that going on this trip, we were you know, raising awareness on the effects of climate change. But to actually be there and to really just stand in the middle of it, it's, it's, it's shocking. To make matters worse, to get to our next camp at 4,000 meters, we have to climb the vast Barranca Wall, a foreboding 250 meter high rock face. Where the treks are getting really difficult was when we reached the Barranca Wall. 
first Sean's knee was hurt, Jack started getting altitude sickness. I had altitude sickness already. I feel like I'm in a dream, I'm sleepwalking. This is the toughest part of the climb so far. It's so steep that sometimes there's no choice but to crawl on your hands and knees. But the views are spectacular. We finally reached Karanga Camp in the late afternoon at 4,000 meters above sea level. It's been an exhausting day. Up here, we start to get the full sense of the mountain's hostile environment. It's freezing, snowing, and emotions are beginning to fray. Like tiny little hills. It's like snowing. <laughs> but it's kind of pale. Oh, really snowing. Oh. Are you allergic to snow or is there something wrong? Oh, it was snowing know. in London when I left. <laughs> <laughs> Don't come to Canada, you just end up crying all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you live in Hong Kong for nearly all your life. <laughs> Day 6 dawns and we leave Karanga for base camp at 4,600 meters, the last stop before the climb to the summit. The weather is calm and bright and the guides oh, sing to cool us, guy, lifting guy. our spirits. Uh, uh, but then the weather turns as we reach base camp, our last refuge before the summer climb. We're cold, we're wet, and we're all very tired. The idea is that we sleep now until dinner, which is six, and then we climb from 12 to six in the morning. I didn't realize how dangerous it can be to get up to Kilimanjaro until I saw a grave, so people they die. The pain in my stomach and in my head, it was just throbbing like I just wanted it to be done. The group is feeling anxious and Jocelyn is experiencing bad headaches due to the altitude. Theo, our main guide, gives us the final briefing before our summer climb. It's normal we go poly poly without much break on the way because if you make so much break, you're going to freeze. What is important, if you have a bad headache, strong headache, you're not allowed to continue. Try to drink more water, okay? Think yeah. positively. If you think headache, you must get headache. Time, I mean, in four hours from now is enough for you to sleep yeah. again. No pain, no gain. When Adventures to the Edge returns, we climb through the ice cold night and driving snow in an attempt to make the final assault on the summit. It's here that the mountain decides to throw everything it's got at us. Very difficult, very slow. I was so exhausted. I wasn't very confident that we would make it to the top. It's much harder than anyone expected. I'm Sean Lee Davis, and I'm leading a team of celebrities on a Project Sea Change expedition to climb Africa's highest mountain, Mount Kilimanjaro, to raise awareness about climate change and vanishing glaciers. This has appeared in only the last four years. You can see the effects of climate change right before your eyes. I really hope we can take care of this planet so other people can see all these amazing things. Already we've been through a variety of ecosystems from rainforest to alpine desert. The weariness of the climb is being replaced by excitement as we prepare to climb the summit. But nature has other plans for us. Blizzards. It's midnight since we begin our six hour climb through pitch darkness, icy winds and snow. We're all feeling anxious but excited at the same time. Got a great team, great energy, great goal and great cause to really live for. So we're really, really excited and nervous. <laughs> it's time to gear up and head off. We have to switch to night vision to film in the darkness. All we can see on the horizon is a surreal trail of lights from other climbing teams walking up the mountain. We may be moving slowly, but it sure feels like a lot of effort. That's the thin air, the oxygen level in our blood. It's probably gone down to about 60-70%. We just hope he doesn't go down any lower. We would see um, people fall by the wayside and other climbers throwing up from the altitude sickness. We're walking at a very slow pace, and that's because yeah, at this altitude, we don't want to climb too fast. From base camp to the summit, it's approximately a seven-hour climb. 
To add to the high altitude and thin air, the temperature plummets to minus 16 degrees Celsius. At one point, Jocelyn, you know, started to struggle and was pretty adamant that she wanted to turn around. I never felt so exhausted from altitude sickness in my life. I decided to stand behind Jocelyn, encourage her to take each step and telling her that we would make it. Two words that the guys would say was kuche kuche, which means slow. You go at their pace. Most of us are just concentrating on putting one foot in front of the other. Coming on top of this mountain, you realize you have to take your time. No stress, slowly, easy does it, and you get there. In Hong Kong, everyone's rushing all the time. You don't know for what reason. I haven't done anything as testing, as rigorous as this. It's getting a lot colder now. You can't see it, but the stars are just incredible. We're spurred on by the beautiful night sky and the guides singing, but the altitude continues to take its toll. Jack's not feeling particularly well, so uh, maybe it's going to get better. It's the altitude sickness. If our blood oxygen level were to go below 55%, we could lose consciousness. And if we don't descend fast enough, even die. It doesn't matter how strong you are, lack of oxygen will wipe your body out. To make things worse, Rosemary sprains her back so badly that she can't carry her backpack. The mountain seems to be beating us. My back was in excruciating pain, uh, to the point where I could no longer carry my own rucksack. Five hours in, and the climb seems like it's never going to end. Just like a never-ending spinning class, with the added effects of wind and snow. It really was the darkest hour before the dawn. We were walking step by step, and it was just never-ending. It was mentally really draining. I felt like I was 150 years old, and I didn't see the end. Just when we thought we couldn't take any more, Dawn arrives and the guides start singing. We celebrate. These guys have so much energy. Finally, we make it to the top. Everyone was really happy and joyous. And then the guides say, no, no, we're not there yet. I'm like, what are you talking about? We just made the top. He said, no, you got to go that way another hour. And I'm like, oh. And I was covered in snow, covered in ice. My cameras were blocked up with ice. That's how cold it was. You see people coming with their eyes rolling behind their heads and you're thinking, do they even realize they summited or do they just give up? We were still worried because Jocelyn was showing clear signs of altitude sickness and Jack, honestly, could have passed out. It's another 45 minutes from Stella Point to Uhuru Peak. We have to pick ourselves up and carry on. I believed every single bit that we were going to make it as a team to the very top. It's a total whiteout at the top of the mountain and we can't see more than 20 meters in front of us. But we pass through some eerily beautiful snowy landscapes. Then suddenly, somehow, out of nowhere, we reach Uhuru Peak, the very top of Mount Kilimanjaro and the roof of Africa. Jack is in so much pain from severe altitude sickness that he passes out on the floor. Thankfully though, his condition improves and he gets back on his feet. What an effort. I'm so proud of everyone that's made it this far. Jack, I'm proud of you, my man. Hardest thing I've ever done. I couldn't believe how exhausted I was. So much adrenaline getting up there and then I just crashed. I didn't even know we were going to reach a blizzard up there, so that was a nice surprise. I was so relieved and so proud to know that we all made it together. Yeah, there were a lot of obstacles along the way, but we pulled through as a team. I don't think I could have been able to do it with anybody else. <laughs> We reached the top, but we also came to see the glaciers. Our guy Theo shows us where the glaciers used to be when he started climbing 10 years ago, 
and the difference is staggering. This all used to be glacier, and now it's just a barren valley. In the space of 10 years, it's just completely disappeared. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, literally, the clouds just descended, almost like it just opened for me to be able to photograph and see the glaciers. There are some estimates that Kilimanjaro's northern glacier, which has been up here for tens of thousands of years, will be gone in just a few decades. Overall, Kilimanjaro's famous glaciers have shrunk 82% since the mountain was first climbed just over 100 years ago. If the glaciers disappear, this could affect the ecosystems at the base of the mountain, as well as the human populations who rely on the glacier for their fresh drinking water. Of course, reaching the top of Mount Kilimanjaro is an achievement in itself, especially for a team of Hong Kong models and celebrities you wouldn't normally associate with an adventure like this. We've raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for charity, as well as critical awareness about the rapidly diminishing glaciers. The debate about whether glaciers are receding due to man-made climate change rages on, but in my mind there's no doubt that mankind is causing global warming by pumping unprecedented amounts of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. If we hit a 4 degree increase in temperature in the world over the next 20-30 years, most of the glaciers on the planet will disappear. If everybody just does one thing, it will make a difference. Using CFL light bulbs, which are energy saving. We don't need to consume as much as we consume. Try to use the public transport a lot more. Switch everything off, not to put it on standby mode, make sure everything's off. To offset the carbon footprint of our trip, we planted trees and also bought some carbon credits. I came away with great memories and photographs, but also wondering what else we're destroying in Africa and who's paying the price. I'm about to find out. Join me next time on Adventures to the Edge as I head to Zimbabwe and Kenya to photograph another of Africa's great treasures under threat, the elephant.